Welcome back from the break. It is my privilege once again to introduce our Judy Cole, the association's EVP and CEO, who will present the results from last fiscal year. After Judy speaks, I will share the Alumni Association's Board of Directors roadmap for the year to come. Judy and I will present, and then we will take your questions. Judy, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and good morning. Uh, I, I have to confess, I feel it's somewhat at a great disadvantage after follow, following those first two presentations that we had this morning. I thought they were absolutely fabulous. I'm imagining that you might have as well. Um, it's such a pleasure to see all of you here today as you are all without no doubt uh, MIT alumni community's most loyal advocates. ALC is one of my favorite traditions at MIT because in bringing you all together, it captures in one place that intangible, undefinable, yet instantly recognizable spirit that of the MIT alumni. It echoes one of my other favorite institute events. It's actually my favorite event at every institution I've worked at, which is commencement. Um, in Killian, at Killian Court, we witnessed the graduating class of men and women embark upon their exciting and individual journeys as alumni. No doubt, you can all still feel the energy of that moment yourselves. It is as if for that day, time collapses in on itself with MIT of the present standing next to its past and its future. The pride of tradition, the excitement and electricity of the days and years to come, there is nothing quite like it. We in the Alumni Association understand that it is our charge to serve as stewards of these meaningful milestones. Like commencement and, those, uh, and of those profound relationships you all share with one another and with MIT. And we are so grateful to have our dedicated board of directors and our volunteer leaders like all of you as partners in this important mission. That collaboration led to a wonderful 2016, filled with so many high points. Perhaps the best way to begin is to share that story with you by illustrating it by the numbers. Let's start with 134,344. As of June 30, that is the number of living MIT alumni. To break that statistic down just a little bit, 52% of that population is graduate degree only alumni, and 48% of that population is undergraduate alumni. So many alumni living and leading across the globe correlates naturally to myriad opportunities for engagement. To that end, the Alumni Association hosted more than 1,360 events last year, and they were attended by more than 51,000 individuals. This represented a 5% increase over FY 2015. A great deal of excitement was witnessed at tech reunions where we shattered previous attendance records by 570 people to welcome nearly 4,500 individuals to campus. And last year's ALC was also a record breaker at 670 people showing up for that fall gathering. The association made an investment in support of expanding career resources and events. This year we held two inaugural virtual career fairs, which drew nearly 2,200 registrants from 50 states and 51 countries to meet with participating employers. I also want to spotlight a series of Cardinal and Gray and Emma Rogers Society combined events across the country. This mini road show served as a way to bring together these important constituencies around topics that spoke to their mutual interests. And the banner celebration of the year was the fantastic MIT 2016, celebrating a century in Cambridge events, as, as Marty Schmidt referenced. Um, we were active participants in the planning and execution of many of those events. From the Alumni Day of Service, to the Moving Day Parade, to the pageant on Killian Court, and to my personal favorite, the fireworks extravaganza during the Toast to Tech. It was indeed a celebration worthy of an inspirational moment in history. My favorite memory of that, of the Toast to Tech evening, was um, after the toast had been made and the fireworks are 
happening on the river. There was a student worker who was uh, staffing the event for the Alumni Association on the stage with me, and we got to talking, and it turned out that he was a first-year student, and um, he wanted to learn more about the Alumni Association, and he actually followed up. I didn't have any business cards, but he actually followed up with me a few weeks later and came over, and we had a nice long chat, and it was it's those kinds of... Uh, very personal one-on-one -on -one conversations, I think, that really make such a difference in some of those uh, big events. Through these activities and events, volunteers, like all of you, played a central role. Our volunteer numbers are strong, both with our long-standing programs like clubs, classes, and groups, and with new initiatives such as the formation of the MIT councils. I imagine many of the club people here may have participated in a council activity last year. These councils were created at your request, at a request that was made in an ALC several years ago, to share volunteer experiences and foster lasting relationships. Convened by members of the Alumni Association Board of Directors, seven club councils met, each met twice last year via teleconference and shared best practices, discussed club reporting requirements, and most importantly, built connections among the club leaders. Another example of the value of volunteers, the MIT Educational Council, many, many of our best volunteers start as educational counselors. The Educational Council increased the number of alumni interviewers to 5,250. They conducted more than 17,000 interviews. ECs include alumni from the classes of 1941 all the way through up to 2015, with 35% of the volunteers hailing from the last decade of graduating classes. Moving over to fundraising, I have another number to share with you. $75.7 .7 million. That is the total dollars raised by the MIT Annual Fund, what makes this statistic even more significant is that we were celebrating the annual fund's 75th anniversary. 75 in 75, what a fabulous way to honor that milestone. And what, <laughs> and what some members of the um, annual fund goals committee will recall, that was actually our secret goal when we were setting the goals for the fund for the year. Uh, we, we thought that would be kind of cool, but nobody was confident enough that we would actually achieve it to want to put it in writing. So we made the, the, the original goal was 70, well, the, the original goal was a little bit less, but then it was 72.5, and we exceeded that by $3.1 million. So that was really quite exciting. There was a lot of celebration after June 30 or early July. We can surely thank the nearly 44,700 alumni, student, parent, and friend donors who made this fundraising achievement and a 9% increase over FY 2015 a reality. I also want to thank all of you who made peer-to-peer -peer solicitations and encouraged your classmates and friends to give back to their alma mater. That makes all the difference. I want to give a special nod to the Sloan School volunteers who led an initiative to gain more than 5,000 donors and reach a higher than ever participation rate. The MIT Sloan Global Giving Challenge exceeded the goal of 27% participation with more than 5,400 Sloanies coming together to reach 29% participation and raise $4.6 million, including an extra $500,000 from their volunteer executive board chairs. Congratulations to the Sloan volunteers in this audience. Many of our donors chose to contribute through our newly launched MIT Giving website, which was a major collaborative effort uh, for many teams across advancement, but one that will have substantial impact on our fundraising efforts going forward, which will be very important during our campaign, our public phase of our campaign. To give you a sense of volume produced by all of these efforts collectively, in 2016, we completed more than 160,000 gift entries and record updates. This is also a record high number of transactions for the Office of Records. Back to the figures and to a simple number one. That was the ranking of the MIT Alumni Association's Facebook and Twitter <laughs> presences among all of our Ivy Plus peer schools in terms of the proportion of our alumni 
who are engaging with MIT on social media. Related to that, the association's slice of MIT blog recorded almost 600,000 unique views, a nearly 20% increase from FY15. Last year also saw the onboarding, development, and rollout of a number of new applications for mobile-based, uh, new applications for mobile-based event information, text-enabled giving, and behaviorally curated MIT news content. Encouraged by our board, we are pleased to announce a new platform for peer-to-peer -peer interactions. You'll find it at, uh, it's called Switchboard. You'll find it at switchboard.mit.edu, and here you will be able to ask for what you need and offer up what you can share. Things like advice, jobs, internships, rides, services, and more. The platform has relied on many of you as early adopters, and now we are ready for you to share information about the new platform with your peers. All of these wonderful figures added up to one big, tremendous 2016. And for all that each of you did to make, the, make it a year to remember, we in the Alumni Association offer you an equally tremendous thank you. Now that we have covered looking back, it is time for us to turn our focus ahead to our plans for making 2017 even greater. I would like to turn the podium over to the president of the Alumni Association, Nicholas Shamas. While Nicholas has been at the podium several times so far during ALC, he's not been formally introduced. So first, a little about Nicholas. He is the chair of the LED Shamas and Company Holdings. He is the vice chair of Cedrus Bank and the president of the Beirut Traders Association, the oldest employers organization in Lebanon. He earned his SM in civil and environmental engineering at MIT, his MBA from the Harvard Business School, and a bachelor's degree from the American University of Beirut. He has served twice on the association board and been the Educational Council's regional chair for Arab countries for more than a decade. He is the founder and first chair of the Enterprise Forum's Pan-Arab Region Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Shamas back to the podium. I really have to apologize in advance for my lengthy remarks, but there is so much going on at the association. So Judy, thank you very much for providing us with that snapshot of the terrific successes of last year. As your AA board president, I am delighted to be working with all of you to ensure that we build upon this momentum to even greater effect and success this year. I will be providing you with a roadmap detailing how we intend to reach the next level of growth during FY17. But we, before we drill down into this, I would like to just take a moment and share with you how thrilled and humbled I am to be, I am to be your president today. As with all of you, this institution and its great community of alumni, faculty, students, friends, leaders, staff, innovators, and dreamers, we all had a game-changing impact on our lives. It is my profound privilege to have served as a volunteer, as Judy just said, in service to the Institute for three decades. I am sure that you, like me, take immense pride in knowing that in our roles, we have been able to act as connectors bringing our fellow alumni together around these commonalities and perspective. Or that you are proud to serve as ambassadors of that spirit to those beyond our internal community in the fields in which we practice. I have said before that MIT, or my MIT experience is a gift that never stops giving. I live my life every day fueled by the two key takeaways from that experience. The first, is to never let yourself be caged in any paradigm or situation, and to always think outside of the box. And the second, set ambitious goals and constantly raise the bar for yourself and others. As I talk through what the board of directors has set for our priorities for FY17, I ask each of you in this room today to think about those priorities in the context of those two takeaways. How can we, both individually and collectively, approach the goals designed to meet the needs of our community. 
I would like to introduce to you the members of the Association Board of Directors who will share the journey with me this year and support these goals. Association Board members, will you please stand to be recognized? Well, I, I see that more than half my board has almost vanished. They are, they are overworked and underrested. We will refer them to Professor Picard later on. I, in particular, would like to acknowledge the board's president select, Juana Park. This year, Juana will be tapping into her outstanding leadership skills to chair the program committee which is casting a special spotlight on engaging our community's allied parents and friends. Thank you, Joanna, for all you will do this year and next when you take the baton from me. I also want to take the opportunity to highlight that for the first time ever, we will be inviting two current, or we have invited actually, two current students, the undergraduate association president, Sophia Liu, and the Graduate Student Council President, Aroline Conwell, to join our board meetings on an experimental basis. We have done that for two reasons. The first one is inclusiveness, because at the level of the Alumni Association, we like to keep our doors and windows open. And we have experienced the, how valuable the input of the MIT-10 cohort is to our discussions and to the work of the board. So we have decided to go upstream to the students' level and have them with us participate in the works of the board. And uh, we think that it is extremely important for us to know what is on their minds and at the same time for them to know what is going on at the level of the association because they are the alumni of the future. The second reason is the one of uh, indeed uh, alignment because there are several constituencies within MIT, you know, the students, the faculty, the administration, the alumni, and the friends and parents. It is important that we all are on the same page. And by the same token, we have invited uh, high-ranking institute representative, Vice President Kirk Kohlenbrander, into the meetings going forward. We believe that the inclusion of these three new voices and perspectives can only enrich our process as we on the board tackle the priorities we have set before us this year. Now, what are those priorities? The first charge we have put forth is one that addresses a significant portion of our alumni population, whom perhaps have not been engaged as deliberately in the past. How do we increase graduate student and graduate alumni participation in MIT and MIT Alumni Association programming? Here's the thing. Anecdotically and then empirically, we have seen, we have discovered that graduate alumni have very favorable feelings about the experience they had at MIT. And uh, also, they are very present as far as the demography as alumni is concerned, because they now constitute 52% of the alumni population. This is on one hand. On the other hand, they are much less engaged than undergraduate alumni. So we wanted to understand why we had this gap. And in order to do so, we have taken two initiatives that I will be announcing here. Uh, the first one is the establishment of a Graduate Alumni Council, or GAC, which could be viewed as a thematic parallel to the famous GSC. The Graduate Student Council. So through its work with GAC, the MIT Alumni Association hopes to divine the discrete needs and wants of this population while also hoping to discover those nexus points where the experience meet, all in an attempt to build, to build better, a better, more targeted programming, you know, at the level of the graduate students. So, in its founding chair, Harry Reddy, is Harry here? Where is he? Please stand up. And Vice Chair John Wilkins, is John here? Please.
We have found two dedicated, enthusiastic alumni to lead this important work. So we greatly count on you, Harry and uh, John. The second related priority will run simultaneously, but in support of GAC, GAC and that is a one-year graduate alumni working group to study the graduate student experience, really from the cellar to the attic, so that we know exactly what is going on, and this effort will be led by one of our most seasoned volunteers, Mr. Steve Baker. Steve? I suppose a helpful way of looking at this group is that they will serve in a consultative role with both GAC and the Alumni Association by collecting data and uh, thoughts from around graduate and undergraduate students that will inform the mission and initiatives of GAC in the years to come. So it is our hope that through three, uh, these graduate alumni and student-focused priorities, we are able to in the understand this large, diverse constituency a little better and create for them that programs that speak to them authentically. As you may imagine, having this information is not only germane to our mission, but also to the work of the Institute. Our next priority should also go far in terms of reintroducing the MIT experience into the lives of both graduate and undergraduate alumni by meeting them where they live, so to speak. So as you all know, the MIT campaign for a better world was launched as not only a capital investment, but also as an investment in the life-changing global reaching innovation and progress endeavored by our students, faculty, and future alumni. With a goal as ambitious as to create a better world and at $5 billion, a campaign goal nearly as ambitious, MIT will be traveling around the world over the next two years to showcase just we have, what we have done and what we are going to do to make a better world a reality. So starting in October, MIT will be launching a multi-city international campaign roadshow in which MIT will be popping up in your back backyard. The roadshow will move from New York to San Francisco to Hong Kong in the fall semester, then in the spring in London and Israel before returning back to the States in Southern California, then on to Mexico City and ending this year in Washington, D.C and this is just in year one. As the better world message circles the globe, our alumni are obviously a critical part of that narrative. We provide, in essence, the substantiating proof of how the MIT community is ushering in this better world to which we aspire. The biggest way in which you can support the campaign roadshow, beyond contributing to the campaign itself, of course, is your attendance. And if you are unable to attend, we invite you to continue your roles as our community's greatest ambassadors by spreading the word to your classmates and fellow alumni who make their homes and living in one of the cities that we mentioned. If MIT comes to your city, we want to see there in the room a sea of brass rats living, lighting up the room like glinting beacons of <laughs> someone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the speechwriter. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, all of these priorities are serving as signposts for the board's roadmap this year. But just like our connections to our alma mater and to one another, there is no finite endpoint to our journey. There will be always more to go, new avenues to travel down, new groups to discover, and vistas of new connections within our alumni community. And so our last priority is to develop a long-range strategic plan for this board. We have to be looking not just at year-to-year -year goals, but rather at the grander landscape from the highest possible altitude. We want to be thinking about what our community will look like in 5, 10, even 20 years, and to map out commensurate, coherent objectives and goals that will support that growth. In other words, we need to be talking about the long-term game here. I am pleased to report that we are already off to a great start, 
thanks to the efforts of board member Jennifer Yang. Is Jennifer here? She's not, She's not here. Okay who is leading this charge. I would like just to recognize her and say that she has been doing an admirable work. <laughs> this summer, Jennifer connected with Judy, Judy Cole and her senior team to begin the collaborative work that will inform the strategic roadmap. I'm confident that by working together, the board plus the staff, each of us bringing our talents to bear, we will develop an aspirational yet implementable plan that will bring us even greater advances to come. I leave you all with final thought to carry with you today and as you move forward in your chosen roles as MIT volunteers. I have stated that my objective as president this year is to extend and amplify my predecessor's trajectory. Are they here? I see John here. John Chisel. And Don Chobris, who is, I know, in St. Louis today. St. Louis, Don is the past, past president. I also would like to recognize him today. <laughs> the work that we do together now only honors the commitment of those who came before us and who toiled tirelessly to bring MIT students, alumni, to where we are today. We owe it to them and to all of those who will come after us to only soar even higher. Thank you very much. We will now take your questions. Can you wait for the mic, please? The mic is coming. <laughs> I graduated in management, so I was unable to do the math in real time. But uh, I think I saw 1,365 events with 51,000 attendees. Is that about 40 people per event? And why so low? And would you like some help? Well, I don't think that that, I don't think it was, um, it d doesn't calculate out quite that way. Some of the events were very large, some were very small, and that's by design because you want to have some events where that are large networking events, and you want others that are much smaller, more intimate, and, and uh, more intense or deeper dives into a subject. Um, but I guess, on average, that would, would be accurate. Maybe the median would have shown a different picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Indeed. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. Sorry. <laughs> Up there, Meredith? Right, thank you for updating us on sharing what, uh, what activities have been developing. I'm wondering as alumni, are we, uh, how we're doing in terms of engagement of our alums uh, who aren't in those numbers, in terms of uh, reaching out and being uh, creative uh, ways uh, of doing that. I know during the ALC, we have the sessions about what we do have the meetings among the uh, various alum leadership of new ideas and, and, and how to implement those. But I'm wondering, as the association, how, we're, how, how good a job we're doing at uh, assessing how successful we are at reaching out and how we're engaging those who may not have uh, been here or been a part of the alumni activity, even if they, have, they don't come to the uh, gatherings. Uh, I know globally we have events in our regions and, and uh, those areas, but how actively are we finding creative ways of engagement? And I, I know some of the technologies that we're using and things like that, but uh, just wondering how you're seeing that from the assessment of uh, how we're growing from year to year. So we track engagement um, in, in multiple different ways. We track philanthropic engagement, we track the face-to-face -face engagement, and we track the virtual engagement. And there are obviously overlapping parts of those different circles, but um, Overall, if you looked at the outline of the Venn diagram, we are engaging uh, roughly 48% of our alumni. Um, how does that compare to other people? I can't give you a crisp answer there because I don't know of any peer schools that are counting things or tracking things in the same way. The closest I can come is that there's one other school here in Boston, which is not on the river, um, <laughs> that, that I know does something similar. And their overall engagement was 25%. So I am not unhappy with 48%. But I also believe that we can do much better. 
And so we've developed a number of different ways that, that we strive to reach out to people. And these are all ways that you all can help us with. Um, the apps that I mentioned in the presentation are one way, um, because those actually are trackable for us. Most of those are trackable for us. And so if somebody goes on to one of the apps, Switchboard or the events uh, uh, app that many of you may have downloaded for this event or for reunions, things like that, those, those automatically get fed into the database and we know and that can expand our unique alumni. For the staff, the metrics that we use are tracking participation in individual events and programs based on how many new people came, how many people were renewed from previous engagement, and how many were reactivated when, where they had lapsed from their engagement with the Institute for several years. So that's helping us to keep, um, to, 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 to remain aware of uh, whether or not we are reaching out into the parts of the alumni population that may not have been engaged with us recently. I think that this is a great question because engagement is our obsession. As Julie just <laughs> pointed out, if you just take a look at the rendering here of the three circles that she just mentioned, this is a great rendering. And by the way, it is not drawn to any scale. Uh, the, 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 the small circle is the philanthropy. The one in the middle is uh, in person, and the big one is uh, the uh, virtual. So our obsession is to increase the size of the circles, obviously. The philanthropy is the one that you know, keeps us on our toes because <laughs> the long time trend has been really a decline you know, from like 50% participation rate in the 80s. Now we are around 28 or 29%. So this is a real worry in terms of participation, not of dollars, but in terms of participation. As for the others, your, your presence here is a testament to how important the in-person meetings are and we have to give credit to the clubs internationally and locally for uh, you know, enhancing this face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction. As for the big circle, I think that uh, our staff is doing a tremendous work in terms of developing uh, you know, uh, instruments and applications that keep the uh, alumni association at large engaged. Uh, do, do you have numbers on the, the uh, current students and the students, uh, say, the first five years out of graduation? It seems like uh, for any organization, if you capture that group early, they continue throughout a lifetime, while those who might join much later are less likely to do so. And so it seems like one of your major efforts should be to uh, ask the graduating class, and I'm, I'm almost certain you do, to uh, make a pledge and uh, join the association uh, when they get their diploma? We do. We have a, a comprehensive student philanthropy program. We have an undergraduate campaign that begins and covers the, the freshman, or the first year, second, and third year students. And we also have an extremely successful um, senior gift campaign. This year, it set a, a new record, another record, for the 11th year in a row. And it's now at 88.7% participation rate among the senior class. We also track quite actively, not the first five years, but um, actually the, we call it MIT 10, which is our undergraduate alumni in the first 10 years after they graduated. And they have a participation rate in philanthropy that hovers around 31%. And that is the envy of our Ivy peers. To move away a little bit from philanthropy, uh, and, and in order to enhance the other forms of engagement, we have been thinking of onboarding you know, the future alumni as students, not even at t equal zero, but at t equal minus one you know, in their <laughs> local uh, communities. This is extremely important, sir, because what uh, interests us is not only philanthropy, but the sweet spot that is drawn and the colored in red here. This is what the bull's eye for us. And early involvement is extremely important. And we have noticed that the cohort, what we call, uh, you know, between 11 and 25, this is the time, you know, in one's life where you are, when you are establishing yourself and so on. So they, you know, get a little bit disinterested. This is where we have to re redouble our efforts to keep them anchored to MIT. 
One other thing I should mention, because it's not only undergraduate students that we work with, we also have, we, we do not yet have the philanthropy programs for the graduate students, but last year we initiated a new program where we did once a month what we called a taste of dinner, so it would be a taste of India, a taste of you know South America, a taste of wherever. And we had over a thousand unique graduate students attend those events, and we were pleased with that, so of course we're sustaining it again, and it's open to the whole community. Some of them may have attended more than one, but um, other questions? Thank you for an interesting presentation. I have a question. What has been the experience to engage faraway clubs or, or overseas? Uh, there's something I call the inverse distance factor, meaning here in Cambridge, if you say someone, I went to MIT, they say, oh, cool. If you say that in Buenos Aires, or if you say that in Kathmandu, they would say, wow. So <laughs> my question is, has there been any specific experience on reaching out to far, uh, uh, far away places, clubs, and, and communities? So let me see if I, you're asking, how, do, how are we reaching out to the far away communities? Well, um, my, stra my travel schedule would tell that tale somewhat. <laughs> and I think the president's travel schedule would as well. Um, we, we tend to f focus more on the larger concentrations of alumni, naturally, because you're going to be able to reach more people that way. But the president is on the road almost all the time. I'm on the road often, but not quite as much as he is. Um, and there are many different er areas where we're trying to reach out to them. The virtual programs are also a way of reaching those communities. So another program that I didn't mention earlier we have uh, two online programs. One is called Faculty Forum Online, and the other is called Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition. Um, Faculty Forum Online is where I or another member of the staff will interview a faculty member for 45 minutes during the lunch hour about their research and their work. And it's, it, you have to register, but the alumni can um, ask questions, and then they're fed to me on a, through a computer, and I ask the questions of the faculty member. Um, that can be accessed from anywhere, even if there's no club there. And um, the Faculty Forum Online is an effort to engage our alumni who are academics at other institutions and invite them uh, around a specific topic or maybe it's an, a cross-disciplinary topic to have a conversation among themselves. And again, the alumni can ask questions. And that has been, um, those have both been very successful programs. And they continue this year. Uh, you are making a very interesting point because there seems to be uh, you know, a disproportional or, you know, relation. Uh, most graduates, when they are here, they live off campus. Most undergrads or under undergrads live on campus. The feelings are better for those who lived on campus, or off campus, I'm sorry. Same thing as far as the country is concerned. The farther you go, the stronger the MIT brand is. And we found that there is a correlation between graduate and international, because mm -hmm. most international are graduates. And this is one of the hypotheses that the group of Steve uh, is, uh, is, is testing for the, for the years to come, how to try to improve this. But believe me, MIT is extremely well you know, present in those foreign countries. You have the number of clubs is almost equal to the one that is present domestically. And they are extremely active. Anyway, the message is the same across the board. And I would maybe end by uh, you know, uh, recapturing the message of uh, President Reif, who said, basically, that MIT, the MIT community, is active on two levels. On a macro level, we are working to make the world a better place. And on a micro level, at the level of each individual, by preserving the physical, emotional, and intellectual well-being of every one of us. This is our mission. This is our message you know, in Boston or in Buenos Aires. Thank you very much. Oh,